so without further ado, I will now request uh, Dr. Abed Soleri uh, to give his introductory remarks. Over to you, Dr. Uh, thank you, uh, Ahad. Uh, uh, honorable uh, panelists, uh, uh, respected uh, uh, Mr. Rana and Gulzar Sahiba, uh, Ambassador Shapkat Kakakhel, uh, Chairperson, Board of Governors of uh, STPI. Uh, a very warm uh, uh, good morning uh, to all of you, and it's a great pleasure uh, to uh, host you here on this uh, uh, first uh, hybrid uh, clean energy uh, transition summit uh, that uh, STPI team uh, has actually uh, convened, not only to uh, showcase uh, our work on uh, uh, renewable energy, but also uh, to join hand with the uh, private sector and uh, uh, try to take this network, which my colleague had just uh, mentioned, uh, forward. Uh, it's a network on uh, clean and uh, green uh, energy uh, so that uh, Pakistan can actually build better from uh, COVID. So when we are talking of a clean and green recovery from COVID, uh, of course, uh, this energy transition is uh, one important uh, component of it. Now, uh, talking of uh, the existing uh, landscape of uh, uh, energy, as you uh, uh, know, uh, of course, uh, we are uh, uh, now struck with uh, not only capacity payment uh, charges, but also struck with uh, uh, our uh, energy uh, uh, fuel mix, uh, which actually uh, you now sometimes is uh, more inclined to uh, generation of expensive uh, energy. Uh, we are also uh, struck with the uh, uh, issues uh, like uh, this limited fiscal space, uh, for choosing alternatives uh, for our uh, meeting our energy uh, requirements. Uh, and uh, of course, technological issues as you might have been uh, uh, studying in newspapers, reading in newspapers and might have been following in uh, media uh, that uh, now uh, with this dry docking of uh, uh, LNG uh, terminal uh, in Karachi and uh, technical maintenance of uh, uh, some of the hydro uh, power generation uh, plants, uh, there is uh, expected to be that uh, the first week of uh, July would again be uh, quite uh, difficult for electricity uh, consumer. Now, uh, within uh, all this uh, broader uh, uh, scenario, uh, where does uh, this alternative energy uh, debt uh, stands? Uh, how can we actually make the best use of uh, renewable and alternative energy? Not only uh, to create more fiscal space for our consumers, uh, for, for our government, but also give some uh, relief uh, to our uh, consumers. Uh, this is uh, the main thrust of uh, today's uh, dialogue. Uh, we know that only by adopting uh, alternative uh, uh, energy uh, strategies, uh, we can actually overcome uh, the power sector uh, losses. Uh, we can uh, work on uh, capacity, reducing capacity payment charges, which are now uh, reaching uh, to uh, some 2.6 uh, uh, trillion, uh, uh, rupees, uh, which is uh, uh, again uh, a huge uh, amount, uh, sorry, circular debt amount, which is uh, reaching to 2.6 trillion uh, rupees, and a capacity payment charges, which uh, is uh, estimated to reach 1.5 trillion rupees by uh, year 2023. Now, uh, within uh, uh, all this, uh, one can uh, see that uh, there are certain things where uh, uh, certain initiatives. Uh, which uh, government is uh, taking. Government has already introduced uh, this uh, competitive trading uh, bilateral uh, contract markets, uh, whereby this uh, captive uh, procurement and captive buying system of uh, current uh, and power uh, market, uh, that would be abolished. Uh, government is uh, also uh, trying to uh, expand uh, the generation uh, uh, capacity expansion uh, plan. Uh, government is also trying to come up with policies whereby instead of uh, paying uh, capacity payment charges, uh, the uh, fiscal uh, incentive should be given to consumer to consume more electricity. So instead of uh, paying uh, to power generators for not uh, utilizing electricity, actually government is trying to uh, promote the use of electricity through a reduction in uh, uh, tariffs, uh, both for commercial as well as for uh, uh, household uh, consumers. Uh, Pakistan electric vehicle policy uh, that is uh, already uh, there uh, and uh, one is uh, looking forward to welcome uh, the first uh, electric vehicle four-wheeler uh, in uh, uh, Pakistan. Uh, and similarly, this uh, alternate and renewable energy policy 2019, uh, that's uh, uh, of course uh, already uh, there and our government is uh, now trying to uh, roll it out. Uh, 
with this uh, of course uh, there are already uh, commitments on uh, coal phasing out there are uh, commitments uh, on uh, achieving uh, renewable uh, electricity and energy from renewable and uh, hydro uh, sources uh, under this uh, climate uh, pledge so by uh, 2030 uh, it is hoped that 60% of our energy uh, would come from uh, uh, clean uh, sources uh, uh, but uh, all of uh, it is uh, much uh, easy uh, to uh, right and to say then to practice and uh, when it comes to practice and when it come to implement it uh, that's where government require uh, partners and government require partners both from academia as well as from private sector and uh, the whole purpose of uh, convening uh, this summit uh, is uh, to take one step forward uh, whereby uh, the public sector uh, the government agencies uh, academia uh, think tanks and uh, private sector working on Uh, renewable uh, energy uh, they can actually join hands and uh, they can uh, uh, help uh, the government implementing uh, some of uh, the uh, plans uh, that government has already uh, uh, very uh, rightly uh, uh, not only uh, is planning to roll out but uh, is uh, uh, working uh, upon uh, and uh, i think uh, that is uh, something which would uh, take us uh, to green and uh, clean uh, uh, recovery uh, from uh, covid Uh, pakistan as you know that pakistan's efforts for afforestation were uh, recognized globally and that's why pakistan was uh, asked to host uh, this year's world environment day on 5th of june uh, restoring our ecosystem and uh, ecosystem restoration a part of ecosystem restoration is uh, of course uh, reducing our uh, uh, use of fossil fuel uh, reducing uh, our already very limited uh, carbon emission and uh, contributing uh, towards uh, renewable and alternative uh, uh, energy uh, sources uh, as part of uh, uh, this summit uh, uh, we will also be uh, launching uh, two of our uh, reports uh, first report is on a uh, case study uh, conducted on uh, tharcol uh, and the second one is a policy paper on clean energy uh, transition uh, outcome of uh, this report along with our publications Uh, would be uh, shared uh, to all the uh, panelists those would be uh, available on uh, uh, our website uh, for free uh, downloading yeah, and i look forward to uh, two days of, uh, two sessions of uh, uh, learning interacting uh, uh, getting our self challenged and uh, uh, receiving your endorsement where you feel that uh, uh, we are uh, on a right track and uh, with this uh, as i said that st we i always believe in being part of a solution uh, as we work uh, with government of pakistan in different uh, advisory capacities uh, we are uh, the first to uh, pinpoint and highlight if the government is not uh, doing anything right and not only to pinpoint but also we come up with uh, some doable solutions uh, and uh, we commend and we foster uh, try to uh, join hands with the government uh, where we feel that uh, their uh, policies uh, would take us to right uh, direction but uh, we can't do it alone uh, we require stakeholders uh, advices your recommendations your policy suggestions and i hope uh, that uh, today's uh, uh, this uh, summit uh, would help uh, both you and to stpi uh, to collectively help uh, the government uh, in its uh, vision of uh, moving towards alternative and uh, renewable energy thank you very much so the project was almost uh, conducted uh, during the last uh, one year uh, we had around eight public private dialogues uh, there were two focus group discussions and uh, several uh, uh, stakeholders were engaged uh, i've been told by the team that around 300 stakeholders were engaged in this uh, so i would uh, now request dr dina to actually share the story of uh, uh, of the uh, project and how we conducted it uh, so over to you dr hina thank you so much ahad um and thank thank you so much uh, dr abid for setting the scene and uh, for providing the background of the whole in, um background of the um uh, clean energy transition project so as ahad has already given a little bit of background i would just like to go through um some of the key research focus and the objectives that we have managed to um um managed to um achieve through this project um before the onset of this project um there was peak covid times we had um um of course with the uh, uh, ongoing realization of um 
clean energy investments um, needed to meet the climate change impacts, uh, being Pakistan the most um, top most vulnerable country of the um, of the world. Um, we the co the onset of COVID made us realize that how important it is to build back better in a more resilient and climate friendly way, in a more sustainable way. And I think renewable energy being the cornerstone of this, um, took this um, uh, pathway along and uh, we managed to um, do this research and advocacy um, project on renewable energy transition, clean energy transition, predominantly um, looking into the opportunities that we have in renewable energy sector in Pakistan that could counter the uh, the ongoing crisis in the energy and the power sector that is impacting the economy of Pakistan as well as the socio-economic conditions and the socio-economic situation of the people living um, in in the country. So the three main key objectives that we uh, have aimed to achieve is to launch an inclusive strategy for clean energy needs. Um, so specific policy solutions we have proposed that could be considered by the policymakers that how we could make a shift towards renewable energy more proactively. And the second is to strength, strengthen the legislation and the policy support for risk management by considering various aspects of coal investments in Pakistan and coming up with optimal strategies as well as focusing on investments for sustainability and decarbonization of the energy sector. And also, <clears throat> With this advocacy, successful awareness of the message through the stakeholder consultations we have done by engaging the Pakistani decision makers uh, from the energy sector as well as from the Chinese leadership and the investors under CPEC to divert their priorities towards renewable energy projects and technologies. To meet these objectives, we have the research outcomes that have been um, uh, already um, described by Dr. Abid. The one is on the clean energy transition, a policy paper, and the other one is on the prospects of coal investments in third and the potential of renewable energy transition over there. These, the executive summary of both reports are uploaded on the website and the technical reports will be available in the next two days for you to download. Um, for, the, um, for, for the audience we have in person in this, um, in this hall, uh, we have actually printed out the executive summary for your um, um, for your reading and for your um, um, for your analysis, and we shall be um, presenting those in my next presentations, where I'll be covering the detailed aspects of what we have researched and what policy recommendations and what actionable ways and pathways can Pakistan adopt, and the stakeholders can consider to move forward. Um, to meet the objectives of our alternative renewable energy policy, electrical vehicle policy, and all the recent green initiatives being taken by the government of Pakistan. And we are really encouraged to see all these reforms and all these um, uh, policies that are coming um, through um, um, in our way. Uh, and, um, but how to make it into actionable uh, plan? Uh, we need a clear pathway, concrete action, and timeline to make them happen. And that's what, what, I, what I'm going to describe in more details in my next presentation. I would just give a floor back to Ahad to invite our chief guest, please. Thank you, Dr. Hina. Uh, I would now request uh, uh, Ms. Sandana Gulzar, member National Assembly, to give her keynote speech. Uh, good morning. Assalamu alaikum ji. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bahat shukriya ji aapka. Aapne mujhe, uh, maine shuru mein suna ke we can speak in both languages, both English and Urdu. I'll try to do a mix. Um, given that I have 10 minutes, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the SDPI for two reasons. One, for giving me the opportunity both to listen to certain important input today. Uh, I believe listening is an underrated uh, skill. So I'll be, I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to listen to some of the experts on this project. Secondly, I wish to thank both Dr. Abhik Kayum Saleri and the SDPI for doing this kind of groundbreaking work. Um, I'm no stranger to SDPI. I've worked with them for the last nearly 24 years. And so happy to be here 
here at this forum and to see the kind of work we're doing, which is right now not being carried out in many parts of the Commonwealth, where I'm currently the chairperson of the Women Parliamentarians. And I'm incredibly, this is a proud moment for me. So thank you. Uh, secondly, I'd like like to emphasize that I'll be speaking in, on five different issues. I will uh, enumerate at the end of this keynote certain um, efforts that the government of Pakistan is doing, uh, but I think I want to talk about the role of parliament in what is happening at this point in time. But before that, I'd like to pick on an important point, which is the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative. I was at the World Economic Forum Regional Summit in Jordan in the year uh, 2019. And I remember I was part of CNN panel on CPEC and the BRI. And I remember I got some very interesting questions on, on the BRI from certain analysts. All of them were non-Pakistani and non-Chinese. And I found it quite interesting that the BRI, something the CPEC, which we see as a lifesaver for this country, for growth production, for our friendship with China, was seen as an incredibly intrusive element in global politics. Um, after the recent G7 summit, I'm no longer surprised. But when I heard that, I realized that uh, things are very different in this part of the world. And Alhamdulillah, I have to say, having been in September 2000, October 2018 to Jiangsu province, specifically to Shuzhou City, Shuzhou City was a coal mining city in China. Today, it is collected, connected by a bullet train to the rest to Shanghai, a three hour bullet train. It is a completely green city. The motorbikes, the buses, you name it. It looks like a mini Geneva. So I'd like to say that China has actually put its money where its mouth is. And regardless of the fact that we have coal mining projects in our CPEC, I'd like to hold ourselves accountable for that. It's very easy to blame others, but when you don't negotiate well, these are the results you get. Coal, no doubt, is in abundance in Pakistan, particularly in Thar. And it's important to use what we have, given what we've been through. Given that we're in a COVID scenario, and we have your agenda 2030, what do we hear? We hear leave no one behind. We hear build back better. And the Commonwealth in which we say connecting for a common future through innovation and to transformation. This is what to me, this project of SDPI is doing. The clean energy transition is no less than innovation and transformation of how we do business. Most importantly, what does it do for me, a parliamentarian? One thing, employment. I look at everything from employment lens because this is what my people sent me here for. Improving their quality of life is something my country has connected to through the SDGs uh, 7, 13, 14, and 15, which is uh, clean air, uh, which is life above land, life under water. All these things have to be taken care of. I'm grateful to the Speaker National Assembly. We have a task force that is working on these issues and making them more relevant. But what to do about the on-ground realities, the on-ground problems we have? The first problem is globally, it is acknowledged that women are both disproportionately affected by effects of COVID, what they call the shadow pandemic, as well as effect of environmentalism, and no less in Pakistan. Now, given that we're talking about it, transition to clean energy, it simply means that we are going to change the way we do business. This is not about consumerism. Now, the question is, is Pakistan ready for that? And I haven't received a hearty yes. I've talked to many business sector friends, unfortunately, because their focus is solely on profits and as it should be, it's not a charity, it's a business. My fear is that unless we get adequate backup and support from businesses that believe in that this transition, rather than cheaper energy, readily available energy, we're not going to be able to make the sacrifice. And sacrifice it is. It requires enormous amount of resources, a huge amount of skill development, and not just a shift in energy forms, but shift in mental energy. Do we, the old school, accept that what we have done so far will get us no further? That ladies and gentlemen, will remain for us to see. Just one of the go government policies that I'll pick up now and I'll el elaborate on and the rest I'll enumerate towards the end. The electric vehicle policy was a struggle between Commerce Ministry and Climate Change Division. There are those in the EDF and their constituents who feel, and rightfully so, that they've invested tons of money in ensuring that Pakistan has a sustainable supply of vehicles. They would rather we went to hybrid, but hybrid is no better than the regular vehicle. It has the same energy consumption. So the electric vehicle policy was a groundbreaker because we were finally able to convince industry that this is good for the country, not just for the production industry. And that was 
the problem comes in. Often I see at the bottom of each country problems, each country's problems, there will be economic factors, economic decisions that impact the lives of millions. And those who are making those decisions, they have a very hard decision to make. Do we please the production industry that is creating the jobs? Because the government can't create jobs. Pakistan is facing a near pension bomb after 10 years time, maybe even sooner in particular KPK. So since it's not the business of government to create jobs, it is not the business of government to create employment, we're left with the private sector. We have to encourage them. But where do we find that balance? We're talking about the energy mix, but prior to the energy mix is the intentions mix. Is business willing to make the shift? That remains to be seen. Now, let me come to a couple of points uh, that were gr I'm grateful to SDPI for sharing them with me and something that I've been working on in my spare time, of which I don't have too much. First of all, what are the current challenges for Pakistan's energy sector? Well, number one, COVID. Number two, limited fiscal space. Three, circular debt. Four, capacity payments. And five, power sector losses. I think enough is going to be discussed on them without me having to elaborate at this point in time. The good news is, what are the upcoming policy reforms in the energy sector? Number one, we have the competitive trading bilateral contracts market. Number two, the indicative generation capacity expansion plan 2030. Number three, the electric vehicle policy that I already mentioned. Number four, alternative and renewable energy, the ARE policy 2019. And on top of that, alhamdulillah, if I may be allowed to say so, the government's plan inclination towards green energy and environment that include coal phase out, alternative and renewable energy policy, in particular, the hydroelectric uh, policy, which is also already kicked off in KPK with the World Bank $450 million project, the green euro bond, which is going to be launched for the dams, and finally, Pakistan's ecosystem restoration fund, the ESRF. So in any case, this was my short keynote speech. I was told I have uh, 10 minutes. I've used only seven. The point being that I would rather listen than instruct. I'm incredibly grateful again for you to invite me. I'm around for the next 15 to 20 minutes. I have my budget speech at 11 o'clock. So I will listen now to the rest of the participants in this panel and happy to answer any questions if you have and if my knowledge allows. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Shandanaji, especially for uh, highlighting uh, the link uh, uh, among uh, COVID-19, uh, clean, clean and green uh, energy and gender. Uh, I must admit that uh, perhaps uh, this was uh, one of the missing uh, link uh, that uh, uh, today we hadn't uh, thought about. But uh, thanks for setting uh, the tone and uh, we'll ensure that in all the proceedings, uh, we can think of uh, policies that uh, not only are beneficial for uh, the industry and consumer and uh, country, but also for women in particular. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sab. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abed. Uh, I, I would now move to uh, the presentations uh, that are lined up. Uh, so the first presentation is on Pakistan's way forward in the transition, and uh, Dr. Hina will be presenting that. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Chandana, for um, such valuable remarks and exactly um, coming up with some really good recommendations, especially um, the transition to clean energy and renewable energy transition um, crucial for job in, job creation and um, employment and uh, women um, in this sector. As we were preparing for this um, um, for, for this meeting, um, we happened to realize that um, the, the women in this um, um, arena um, are in very less numbers. Um, that could um, majorly um, identify the gap that probably we need to overcome and we need to uh, come up with some, um, some, some, some recommendations on that, how um, important it is to have women playing a major role in this clean energy transition of Pakistan. Uh, without any further ado, I would just like to uh, request my colleagues to um, uh, switch the slides. So, I will be presenting um, the launch of the two publications, the knowledge products that we have produced on Pakistan's way forward um, for, towards a green economy. And um, as I have already, as I have already um, um, given the research focus and the key objectives, I would just like to, and these uh, go, 
I'll just go through these uh, project activities again, where we were able to conduct around uh, seven, and today marks the eighth meeting, including public-private dialogues across Pakistan, and we have tried to cover um, uh, the uh, engaging the stakeholders from all the provinces. Then the two focus group discussions um, that includes basically uh, with the with the think tanks, with the startups in terms of uh, innovations and innovative technologies that we could um, uh, that we could look into for this clean energy transition in Pakistan. And the other one, like um, I mentioned earlier, that the project focus is also to look into how we can divert investments from China from under CPEC towards more clean energy and more towards renewable energy. We do see the trend happening since 2020, and we, so, we see it really encouraging. But um, as we see that um, the, um, uh, the initial investments in third and in coal, uh, we have tried to identify some of the policy recommendations and reforms and actions that would be needed for the way forward, helping the country um, um, towards clean energy transition. We have also conducted um, 15 to almost 25 interviews with key informants and stakeholders and two documentaries that will be played during this summit. Moving on. So these are the, um, the, the cover pages of the two publications we have produced. The executive summary is already available on STPI's website. The technical uh, report we are not going to publish in the interest of uh, saving pages and environment. Uh, we shall only be uh, produce, uh, represent, uh, providing the e-copy uh, available on the project um, page of STPI's website. Moving on, I will start with the policy paper in which um, the specific objectives, if I can uh, move the slide, please. The specific objectives of this policy paper was to identify the major factors behind Pakistan's doubling energy structure and how current policies and international agreements will shape up the environment, um, economy, and the um, uh, environmental and social impact outlook of the country. And to analyze how a renewable energy transition can be made into the current energy system of Pakistan and what would be the impact of cost and environment, uh, cost of environment on the future energy pathways. So if, if we go, if, we, um, if I could just recap some of the challenges that have already been highlighted by our um, distinguished chief guest, Ms. Chandana, on, for the energy sector is the limited fiscal space and the country passing through the third wave, um, the economic impacts have significantly increased um, with the um, circular debt uh, to reach around one point. Um, um, 2.7 and expected to be increased. The fiscal stimulus of Pakistan is uh, 1.2 trillion PKR, that is around 3% of total GDP. Um, and um, the circular debt is, um, they could reach around 4.4 trillion by the end of 2023, as expected. Uh, capacity payments uh, of PKR 900 billion um, has um, been um, identified for the year 2019 and 20. Uh, the, in terms of power sector losses, the discourse had an average loss of around uh, 213.5 billion Pakistan rupees, a uh, combined recovery of 88.7 and I look into the more um, uh, in depth. So this is a map from uh, which we have, um, I have um, extracted from German Watch on the climate risk index of Pakistan. And uh, if we could magnify the map, we could clearly see that Pakistan is ranking amongst the, the, the top 10 countries being vulnerable to climate change impacts. And this is not because of we are contributing to the um, uh, to the um, greenhouse gas emissions um, as um, as the other um, developing countries like China and India, but 
we are um, we are identified to be impacted by the impacts regionally and with, uh, with having the adaptation costs projected to around USD 7, 7 to 14 billion per annum and mitigation costs ranging from 8 to um, 17 billion by 2050. That is the data that we have um, received from, we have got from UNF triple C and the government of Pakistan. And we have also identified the major contributor uh, that is um, major contributor of these uh, emissions are um, from the energy sector, followed by agriculture, industrial, and the other activities. Moving on, I will just like to go through some of the challenges in terms of um, uh, increasing cost of Pakistan's power sector. And we see that the costs are rising along with the need of a rapid transition. Um, there has been um, uh, energy addition network with rising costs. Um, if we could add the supply chains, logistics, and other equipment. So as we see from the total power sector investments, we see the graph to be increased um, in numbers um, in the scenario that we had um, produced in our report published um, by United Nations Economic and Social Commission, Bangkok, that, um, and that is on reform priorities of the energy sector, um, that has clearly showed us uh, the, um, the increasing cost of Pakistan's power sector to be, to be projected for, 2000, uh, to, uh, for 2035. If I go on to the next slide and talk about the deteriorating environmental profile, so as um, the, uh, for the uh, nationally determined contributions, Pakistan targets to achieve 20% emission reduction from its projected emission in 2030. An emissions peak in Pakistan is expected to take, take uh, place much beyond than the year. This is uh, around... Um, uh, from the, uh, it, it is assumed that these emissions of Pakistan will be equivalent to around four or five million tons carbon dioxide equivalent um, by 2030. And given the future economic growth trend and associated growth in the energy demand and the uh, power sector, the peaking emissions in Pakistan will be um, will be ex uh, is expected to go beyond that, as I just mentioned earlier. If I go on next to the, um, um, to just highlighting and combining the results we have from the case study on prospects of coal, we have, um, next slide please. We have, ident we have tried to link it to how, um, we, how do we see the prospects of um, coal investments being done under CPEC in third. That is, um, that is because historically it was brought into um, the government priority to overcome and combat the energy crisis um, uh, and the power outrage that we had faced um, in, um, in 2016. And that is where um, the, uh, for the indigenization of resources, for the indigenization of resources, um, the government plan to um, harness these um, coal, um, uh, these coal resources to generate electricity um, to meet the demands and to meet um, the needs of the country. So, objective of this particular study revolves around analyzing the impacts of coal and the fossil fuels and its implement its implement uh, implications for the long term planning of economic growth in Pakistan and how to, and we are going to determine the prospects of how we can divert these CPEC investments towards renewable energy to lead the country towards clean energy pathways in, in order to meet the NDC commitments and also the targets of SDG 7 along with the other sustainable development goals that are interlinked with the SDG 7. Next slide please. If I could give the overview of the energy sector development under CPEC, there is an investment of 62 billion um, overall under CPEC, 
where the energy sector investments is around 32 to 34 billion. 16 energy projects of 10,400 megawatts of power, accounting for 21.4 billion USD um, has been um, in pipeline. Um, eight energy projects uh, are actively being promoted for around 12.9 uh, billion. And um, there is also an investment um, seen in a huge project of Matiari to Lahore and Pestabad transmission line. So China, having emerged as a major investment in the coal market and the coal power sector in the international finance, has financed overseas coal projects for around 21 to 38 billion. Under the China-Pakistan, we see that the numbers that are being, uh, being shown on the, 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 the slides that um, carries a huge um, uh, amount with the priority projects um, in coal. So we tried to come up with um, an assessment and we have tried to analyze the positive implications, uh, positive impacts and the negative implications. So in terms of positive impacts, um, the development of her as we have witnessed itself has tremendously been improved because of the socioeconomic development and the infrastructure development in the region that um, carried a lower human development index um, in the, uh, historically. And the people were living on, below the poverty line. So uh, the projects that are, um, uh, that are being um, um, done in coal mine and the, the projects that the, the power that, is, that are being produced by third coal plants, um, the, 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 they have provided lots of economic opportunities for the local region. Um, um, to um, uh, to come out of their um, poverty and have an alternative kind of uh, a livelihood um, uh, in terms of um, jobs, in terms of um, uh, having uh, an accessibility to move to other uh, places conveniently. Um, then, of course, um, the <clears throat> indigenization, because it's an indigenous source um, and it's identified to have... Um, a great potential and uh, billions of tons available um, to harness and considering that all our gas um, resources would be depleting in upcoming years and um, the coal um, was seen <clears throat> is seen as a best viable option to um, overcome the uh, the challenges related to the cost um, uh, for um, producing electricity uh, the negative um, impacts are, of course, um, the environmental and the carbon footprints associated with it. Um, some of the financial and power locking, we are going to explain that further um, in the next slide, land resettlement and relocation. <clears throat> Moving forward, we see that Pakistan has recently um, uh, reached a financial closure of around two coal-based power plants under CPEC with a sum of around 2.5 billion. Um, with more capacity to be add, uh, added, the payments could reach an unpayment, unpayment amount of 9 billion US dollars. Um, debt servicing can take Pakistan 41% of the entire budget and China's bilateral loans are nearly 26% of Pakistan's 86 um, billion debt USD. So we see um, these challenges in terms of um, uh, these, the debt, the circular debt, demand expected to remain low due to the COVID impacts, um, uh, dying global investments, um, China's bilateral loans. Um, these are some of the risks that we have identified um, to be able to um, understand that how the future outlook, um, the, the future of the energy sector looks like and the future, um, in upcoming years and how we can uh, come up with uh, suitable uh, measures and policies to overcome these challenges and to counter these challenges. So according to the risk assessment, there is um, LCOE, um, LCOE for the coal power plants, um, for which is around um, 
12.5 to 13.5 um, kilowatt per hour at a capacity factor of 85, um, which is which makes it about 32 percent less expensive than non thermal non coal thermal, um, and potentially it could save around 200 billion annually. So that is the uh, the figures that we have um, we have. Uh, we, we have caught from the um, comparison of levelized cost of electricity of CPEC coal plants um, with oil and natural gas um, based plants commissioned in 2010 to 14. Um, and uh, this data was um, uh, retrieved from the NEPRA device tariffs website. If I, if I move on to the emission side, There, in terms of subcritical coal, um, there is 850 gram carbon dioxide per kilowatt per hour um, is the highest among thermal fuels and lower efficiency. Then LCOE, including emission cost, is around 15.8 to 16.7. Again, it's um, comparison to um, non-coal, it's more, uh, it's less, but it's more expensive than LNG and less expensive than the others um, at the same capacity. Factor. So mo most of these coal power plants, um, especially um, under CPEC, are known to have subcritical coal data as that has just been um, also presented um, on, the, on the slide. And taking these, um, uh, these costs for different sources, um, the, um, the costs of the cost of coal um, goes to around 16.6 um, uh, per kilowatt, which is much larger than the other. Um, and then um, if I move on to the, um, the different um, uh, least cost generation of the different power plants. So at a capacity factor of 85% um, of for thermal fuels, natural gas has the lowest electricity generation cost as compared to coal. However, since uh, these gas reserves are constantly decreasing and being depleted, the Pakistan needs a base load for the longer term. And relying on the indigenous coal apparently looks um, uh, feasible to bring energy security uh, and self-reliance to uh, Pakistan's energy and power sector, as but if we only compare it to the highly expensive imported fossil fuels. Moving on. Let's compare it with the financial model um, of renewables. So if we uh, compare the, um, the, the LSOE of coal and the cost associated with the renewable sources, the average wind power would cost around 0 0.0485 kilowatt per hour solar as um, mentioned 0 0.034 and no capacity payments or environmental costs is associated and it becomes it cheaper than the local or imported coal. We have um, also noted from a recently published report by the World Bank on these variable renewable energy sources, especially this wind and solar, to um, have if um, envisioned to increase 30% share of these um, new resources, um, it could lead to save around 5 billion uh, for Pakistan. And this is actually, um, this, this actually shows um, the, the most economical um, the form of resources that could be utilized being cheaper and having the reduced cost um, uh, to provide these, um, these um, uh, alternatives that could be in terms cheaper economic alternatives uh, and have lower emission costs or capacity payments. If I could just interpret the results um, in, in, in few, um, in few um, lines, the results are basically subjected to a large number of variations. And of course, we have to be very careful interpreting it. So in actual working of the plant, it is mostly underestimated. Most power producers renegotiate the price to a higher value since they have no 
can it profit for long term stability of the plant further the plant faces limitations and risks that are initially not accounted for and it is um, the least cost um, uh, analysis is mostly driven by the capacity factor that could also be limited by the power demand um, scheduled and unscheduled maintenance and instability of the grid so the whole generation mix cannot be based on the cheapest or cleanest source according to our analysis and the policy makers just need to ensure a diversity in the energy mix in case of source becomes a liability moving on in terms of environmental risk assessment we have um, collected uh, we have uh, adopted um, a um, qualitative approach as well where the multi criteria decision analysis was done to identify the impacts on the ecology, ecology and the environment and this specific slides actually goes uh, goes on to um, uh, help us understand the carbon dioxide emissions from the third pole to be 38 to 51 million tons annually and 65% more carbon dioxide emissions is would be than the more of the normal trend and that is again um, this is taken from our um, partners um, study um, we have um, of renewable energy coalition that has been made among organizations of uh, rdpi stpi uh, wwf and ips and this is the study uh, was done by them and identified the emissions that could add with these um, third pole power plants according to the climate analytics support we have also we could also complement um, the finding of their um, analysis suggesting that these emissions of pakistan will increase three folds if these coal power plants are realized moving on so as we see from the graph replacing coal based power plants running on both local or imported fuels can save about 28 million tons of carbon dioxide in a year so as compared to the base case um and the renewable which we would be able to uh, reduce the emissions to around um uh, 28 million tons by 2030 but that does not include construction transportation and auxiliary process emissions that is only associated with what we have um uh, uh, what we could um, see from the third pole power plants as we go on to the next slide these are these were some of the findings that we have found from the technical analysis more details of these would be available in the report and of course um um in the um in the dialogue um for for today we um as some of these policy recommendations have already been highlighted um by dr abed and dr um, by ms shandana on um, the government's um, recent initiatives to um, to counter these for uh, these um, uh, mentioned challenges and um, a need for pakistan to transition towards renewable energy sources and that is of course to achieve 30% power through hydro and 30% by solar and wind renewables in the energy mix uh, in the are policy uh, there is a uh, very recently um, released national electric policy of 2021 then uh, the competitive trading bilateral contracts market um uh, can, can you switch the slide please the pakistan electric vehicle policy euro bonds ecosystem restoration fund so i would not just go on and repeat the 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 details of these and would like to quickly just um go on to the opportunities that um, we have identified in terms of clean energy transition so the first is as we have identified through our results is the declining cost of renewables so unsubsidized cost of the wind is um around 26 to 54 dollars and unsubsidized cost of solar pv it has also dropped to uh, in the same period as the graph identifies i would quickly move on to the next slide in the interest of time and the um in terms of um pakistan's um, electricity access we do see a 50 million around 25% of the population is still without grid 
and um, how we could um, you harness this potential opportunity to have these renewable um, energy sources like um, uh, on-grid and off-grid solutions for these uh, rural electrification programs is um, uh, it, it does provide a um, platform for, um, for, for us to um, harness this um, potential. Moving on, if we have, um, if we see uh, in terms of um, emission control, we, we see that the energy transition scenario can actually save 380 million metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions. And that is taken from our existing study that we have done last year on the reform priorities of the energy sector. And uh, this is available on our website and also on the UNSCAP website. Then, um, as um, already been highlighted, a very important point of in terms of increasing jobs and green employment, there is a global report of IENA, uh, Renewable Energy and Jobs, um, just published in um, 2020, in terms of um, giving these figures of global employment in the energy sector, we having potential to 11.5 million increased jobs with an annual increase of 4.5%. 4, 4 and average employment factors, jobs per megawatt over life of facilities, highest for solar PV as compared to the other conventional sources. So these are uh, some of the facts that we have received, uh, we, have, we have extracted from our literature review. But again, um, under the um, spies of the, um, the initiatives that we see in the clean energy transition, there are some major challenges that we see in the clean energy to meet these clean energy transition goals. And the first one is the lack of grid capacity infrastructure, data gaps in the potential um, RE sources, um, lack of institutional coordination and bureaucratic delays in the project, uh, approvals, lack of planning, lack of enabling conditions, and uh, financing. And this, this analysis basically suggests that the climate and the energy policies emerged through a complex uh, interplay of diverse roles of actors and pol uh, as a mean of implementing policies. So Pakistan's recent focus on indi indi indigenization carries a major concentration on development of coal and increased share in the main source of electricity generation. And the power sector suffers from these fragmented institutional and structural disconnections and basically ignores the holistic view and focus only on the power sector. For instance, this development of coal has observed a two-dimensional debate among the stakeholders in Pakistan. And the study identifies that these are some of the stakeholders bigger admiring the role of coal in the energy security and the economic advantages, while the others advocating the adverse Im impacts of this coal um, for the future supply pathways and the potential of financial locking in the longer term. <clears throat> One of the example is the recent proposed indicative generation capacity action plan. <clears throat> proposed, um, prepared by NTDC and pre um, presented to NEPRA. And these are some of the consul uh, some of the basic points that we have <clears throat> analyzed in our, um, uh, with, uh, through our experts. Uh, from RE coalition that I had already mentioned. And it's very important to highlight about that coalition because the collective effort to overcome these barriers of renewable energy transition requires an in-depth analysis, which is mainly done by the experts of these coalition. And according to which we have identified that the current planning document uh, is kind of um, not uh, going in, um, towards the goodwill of ARE policy of um, increasing the share of 30% because according to this uh, IDC plan, um, the renewables uh, share will be decreased to 12% after 2030 and um, the, the coal uh, share will be increased. So that is somehow um, kind of uh, the international commitments that we have or the goodwill of the VRE is kind of disregarded. Uh, as we could uh, mention. And uh, another aspect to be highlighted would be um, in, in this plan uh, is, the, is the massive reduction of the volume of wind and solar as well. Um, and um, as this plan is made by NTDC already, 
uh, we um, uh, and that also I highlighted the potential uh, made the report with the World Bank. Uh, the, the two um, studies are in a, in a great conflict of identifying that whether VRE would be economically um, suitable for the country or um, whether we should, um, uh, you know, uh, be listen or we should uh, imply by these uh, proposed IGC plans. If we um, um, move on, um, there are some more um, more highlighted um, challenges that were um, uh, that were analyzed by our um, by our coalition and by the group in terms of their um, hydropower. Um, in terms of there has been no risk accounting or alter alternative case scenario and the impacts related to hydro, the integration of um, hydropower. For, um, and also uh, considering the climate variability and also the risks of stranded assets um, in terms of uh, when we say that the new plan is envis uh, envisioning an addition of 2970 megawatts of local coal, 960 megawatt of imported coal and 1120 power uh, megawatt of RLNG by 2030 are committed power plants. And these means that they can they are seen as low utilization rates, which decrease to zero percent in just few years, according to the generation model. So the, 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 this is to be go um, in um, um, one of the um, gap that uh, I just want to pick up uh, as an example um, in uh, our recently um, policy uh, reform and a current energy uh, development plan that is needed to identify that what could be a way forward for Pakistan um, to support actually the ARE 2019 policy and the clean energy transition in Pakistan. So the key recommendations and the priorities um, are the prioritized actions for renewables um, because um, we have an opportunity to decarbonize the economy. The way forward from this position is to um, look at um, the RE zoning plan, least cost generation plans, and developing mini and micro grids. Then the technology transfer programs, skill development programs through soliciting investments in local RE equipment to reduce the cost, creating jobs and employment, efficient buildings, clean infrastructures for responsible investments, clean cooking solutions, and regional cooperation to be able to meet the national and international targets of Pakistan. If I go on to the um, next slide, I'm just trying to um, wind up the key recommendations that um, we have um, identified through these um, two research products. An integrated energy plan considering investments in generation, transmission, distribution, and energy efficiency is required. Solar and wind electrification for improving energy access in scattered and rural communities is required. Public-private partnerships, the government needs to focus on encouraging private sector and renewable energy grid investments and provide incentives. Streamlining the net metering system that has been introduced by the regulatory authority, NEPRA, and develop a comprehensive distributed power generation plan. And the private sector should also incorporate the other um, environmental uh, frameworks such as ESG, environmental, social, and governance dimensions in terms of having responsible investments. If I go on in terms of the, um, these are some of the recommended actions that needs to be done by the stakeholders, national government, um, the provincial governments, industry, research, associate, uh, research institutes, and the inter, uh, intergovernmental organizations. Moving on, please. Uh, in terms of role of financing, <clears throat> there's um, uh, city investment banking company, um, was to spend around one tri trillion in sustainable um, uh, development and sustainable energy in the upcoming nine years. Um, then there is a growing pool called global capital around the world um, uh, that uh, is looking for the investments, uh, sustainable investments. Then um, oil and gas companies are looking into the investments into renewables with a large finance, finance, uh, financial um, availability. Then uh, we have United Nations Guiding Principle on Business and Human Rights. And World Bank has also approved the RISE program for Pakistan in terms of resilient institution for sustainable um, economy program under which um, it is implementing foundation reforms in the energy sector to a low carbon energy transition uh, for the country. 
if I just go on to the um, next final slides, um, the last uh, but not the least is uh, in terms of greening CPEG. Um, so in terms of having investments coming under CPEG, both countries must find a common framework to identify the environmental risk evaluation and reporting of the financial institutions from both sides. There should be guideline frameworks for investment banks to develop and implement a well-defined roadmap to better evaluate and mitigate those risks. Pakistan policymakers must prepare a plan with a more concrete timeline to introduce these risk and uh, ESG and environmental social risk management system in CPEC projects with green development guidelines and evaluations compliance standards, including green financial performances. Then again, additionally, the private sector could play a major role in these practices to comply these, um, these uh, targets with their sustainability initiatives bounded by nature climate related disclosure policies. Then these options should be leveraged by aligning the sustainable investment priorities with climate and green financing strategies such as green bonds, debt for nature swaps, social investment bonds, and other financial tools. Please moving on. There are some of the carbon pricing, technology transfer, trade policies, renewable portfolio standards, tax incentives, capital grants, um, battery storage technologies, um, the um, upcoming um, uh, national nuclear and hydrogen roadmap. Um, also, not to um, um, also uh, suggesting to reconsider re um, the options of coal to liquid and coal to gas technologies. Um, because um, environmentally um, that is not sustainable uh, as well. This is in reference to the um, uh, to the recent announcement of PM on uh, diverting the coal investments to coal to gas and coal to liquid. That is again um, to be uh, looked at uh, very deeply in terms of both economical feasibility of these technologies um, and uh, viability for Pakistan and also the environmental implications that are associated with it. All right, um, I think that is all uh, from my side. The last slide is just uh, about the green energy, trans uh, the uh, just transition. Uh, a just transition is about uh, a green economy that would require a transition, transition policies in terms of if we are talking about diverting the investments from fossil fuels to um, renewables, we need to make sure that these, um, the, we need to have green enterprises, social protection policies, active labor, occupational safety and health policies, skill development and mechanism for social dialogue and policy coherent mechanism. Climate risk accounting, disclosure policies, land use rights, the relocation, reclamation policies, pollution laws and liabilities can strengthen these social dialogue mechanisms and uh, would enforce transitional laws and ensure proper communication resulting in green jobs, promoting standards and fundamental rights to work, creating greater opportunities for women and men for these green uh, employment, um, increased income and enhanced coverage uh, of the social protection and um, um, uh, coming out of the poverty as a whole SDG one. Um, so this is all from my side today. I know it took me too long because I had to take the cuts out of two reports um, um, in, uh, collectively and um, uh, in a way that it actually uh, could cover all the important aspects and the findings uh, and also uh, have, uh, providing the way forward and some of the recommendations that we have come uh, up with these um, from these research, uh, uh, research papers. So thank you so much uh, for this opportunity, Ahad, and thank you so much uh, for uh, my my team members, especially my research associate Ubed, um, to carry out these um, these two, two reports with me um, through uh, his hard work and um, uh, modeling capacities and technical capacities in the energy and the power sector. We welcome any comments and questions, um, and uh, we are happy to address it. My email would um, is just on the screen. And I'm happy to answer um, any related um, uh, questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I would now request uh, Dr. Sajid uh, to present uh, Pakistan financing needs and options to support green recovery.
جی ابھی ٹھیک ہے دیکھیے جی بزنس Uh, kind of so uh, very excellent keynotes introduction remarks and some very detailed presentations come correct you see okay so i'm not left much to say so let me just quickly uh, go through i'll i'll be just highlighting on on the facing a gain recovery from covid 19 uh, in pakistan کفار سے جب کہا جاتا تھا کہ اسلام کو بول کریں تو وہ یہ نہیں کہتے تھے کہ یہ صحیح ہے یا غلط ہے وہ ہمارے باپ دادا نے کرتے آئے ہیں تو ہم اس کو کیسے چھوڑ دیں کرونا وائرس ہیز شیٹرڈ دیٹ پاتھ اسٹیگنسی وہ جو ہمارا اوور ویلمنگ فوکس آن جی ڈی پی کمپرومائزنگ گرین انرجی اور انوائرمنٹل کاسٹ سے اس کو اس نے تھوڑا سا شیٹر کیا ہے ابھی ابھی ٹھیک ہے اوکے تھینک یو جی سو اٹ ہیز پرووائڈ ایز این اپرچونٹی فار بلڈنگ بیک بیٹر وتھ تھری کی کمپوننٹ انکلوسو ریکوری Uh, green recovery and the uh, futuristic resilient recovery so I'll, i'll be just focusing on one the green recovery and i have just three key messages to uh, deliver uh, in addition to social and environmental costs uh, green recovery has a very uh, good economic cost as well uh, if you can see uh, the evidence very clearly suggests uh, that dollar one uh, spent in green energy our energy efficiencies can produce 7.5 jobs compared to uh, 2.7 jobs if it is uh, spent in the normal uh, sectors like pakistan is focusing on construction sector uh, the second message that is coming through is while the government has taken some good steps uh, ensuring a green recovery needs some fundamental shift in priorities uh, that are still Uh, missing i will be highlighting just three three key priorities in this uh, regard and one of the key excuse or one of the key reasons for not shifting to green recovery uh, is the fiscal uh, space limitations dr hina also highlighted uh, whenever you talk to government or or any public sector uh, entity uh, they will come that we wanted to do uh, but we have a very limited resources and that definitely has makes sense Uh, in countries like pakistan uh, where we are fiscally constrained i'll be just showing uh, that a political will and just reducing energy sector and transport sector inefficiencies by just 35% can finance a green transition in uh, pakistan so these are some of the steps uh, it's good to see Uh, that when pakistan was designing its fiscal stimulus uh, it has been considerate of the green fiscal stimulus uh, these are some of the key uh, elements uh, one is the expanding on the 10 billion tree tsunami so far uh, the data suggests that 85000 jobs has been producing has been produced uh, they are expecting more than 100000 jobs uh, the world bank is also uh, operating and has pledged 1 dollar 21 million 120 millions uh, for this year uh, pakistan has also launched green euro bond wapda is already raised us dollar 500 million through green euro bond uh, debt for nature swap uh, are uh, being sort of discussed in a more detailed and and are being considered as a systematic tool to finance uh, green recovery and couple of days uh, pakistan has signing or is about to sign agreement with uk canada germany italy for debt swaps 
uh, and then we have also established an ecosystem restore fund and this is the umbrella program of 10 billion tsunami uh, that, that we see so these are some of the key uh, components that government of pakistan has been considerate of while designing uh, the fiscal stimulus and we call it a green fiscal stimulus uh, but uh, we, we think uh, that this uh, may not be sufficient uh, because uh, the economic activities in the counterpart sectors like construction sector are compromising the gains from so uh, this will not go hands in hands though it definitely uh, minimizes loss to some some extent uh, and and improves the environmental considerations at least uh, but to have a green recovery which is a sustainable uh, pakistan need to have at least three key priority areas uh, the one is to transition to renewable energy uh, that must be the priority focus uh, the one is to shifting to green transport uh, one of the key inefficiencies in pakistan uh, causing huge losses i'll, I'll come into it uh, is the green uh, is the transportation and there is now shifting to green transports brt and other uh, metros can be opportunities but they need a better uh, focus and planning and then uh, eliminating fossil fuel price subsidies one of the key dilemma uh, that we see at pakistan both at state bank of pakistan and the government of pakistan treasury fiscal policy and monetary policy uh, for example while state bank is promoting uh, it is encouraging uh, credit to green investments green financing uh, but at the same time it continues to finance non green uh investments and which are overwhelmingly higher at the larger than the green financing so they compromise the gains similar is on the fiscal uh, policy side so let me just go directly on the financing needs uh, uh for renewables uh pakistan if you see uh, the bold line a uh, green bold line tells the additional cost of having a green recovery uh, the recovery with the focus on uh green economy will require substantially higher amounts of investments compared to a standard recovery uh, from the covid 19 uh, which is a thinner line uh, below so the gap between these two lines shows additional demands in the uh, investments uh, in the energy sector renewable sector if if we wanted to ensure uh, green recovery and this sounds a good uh, sort of amount additional uh, investments which is required Uh, similarly if you see the financing needs for the green transportation by 2030 uh, the red number is for the pakistan that is pakistan need an additional 38.5 billion dollars uh, to move towards a green transportation by uh, 2030 so in other words this is dollar 3.8 billion per year and the number 3.8 sounds a bit smaller but compare it with the 6 billion dollar program that we have uh, got from imf Uh, this is roughly uh, 35 i mean roughly more than 60 billion around i mean 60% of that so it 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 sounds an a huge amount amount uh, that pakistan will need and this is where the government's uh, sort of position on fiscal space limitations uh, come into and it sounds very realistic uh, but let's see uh, where we can come from just uh, eliminating uh, inefficiencies i mean fossil fuel subsidies pakistan roughly has per annum 2 billion dollar uh, fossil fuel subsidies and if we can reduce only 35% of these subsidies in the short term if you see the scenario one at the bottom uh, we can save roughly 665 million uh, per annum if we can reduce in the short run medium run uh, what we are calling by the short run is by 21 to 24 if we reduce gradually 35% of these subsidies uh, we will be having 665 million rupees uh, dollars to save uh, but if we can cut half by 2025 we can save per annum around 1 billion dollar that is 90 uh, 950 million dollars and this is roughly 1 billion dollars uh, uh, the savings from cutting 75% of these inefficiencies uh, uh, on the subsidies that government of pakistan is providing to the fossil fuels can save us 1.4 billion dollars uh, if we can cut but let's take a very low scenario uh, that government can save per annum only 665 uh, 
millions. So you are left with the roughly three billion more needed to invest in green recovery from 3.8 billion per annum. So this is very interesting that reducing only energy and transportation sector inefficiencies can finance the whole green recovery. And this is based on uh, a very rigorous research by the World Bank and many other, and we have also uh, been uh, under going through some simulation models on this one. Uh, Pakistan can save pro approximately dollars seven point six nine billions if energy inefficiencies are eliminated to zero. So energy inefficiencies are costing Pakistan roughly dollar seventeen point six nine billion per annum. But let's again stick to the lower scenario side. Scenario one, if we can only reduce these inefficiencies by 35%, uh, it can save you around $12 billion if we can reduce inefficiencies both energy and transportation sector. Uh, the transportation sector inefficiencies are causing Pakistan a loss of 4 to 6% of GDP. Only trucking, the trucking system that is on the freight truck system is roughly causing a loss of inefficiencies of $3 billion uh, per annum. So if you can improve, improve only your trucking infrastructure, trucking system, you can finance per annum $3.8 billion required for the green transition or the green uh, energy. And this is much more uh, 4 to 6% of uh, GDP that is available there that you can save. Uh, if we can cut them half by 2025, uh, so it, it, it's roughly the saving is more than $50 billion per annum. This is per annum. And this is 2.5 times of the IMF program that we have taken. So, so uh, but definitely it will require a very strong political will because the interest groups are very strong uh, there and definitely. Uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that you can improve energy sector within in reducing the inefficiencies from the energy sector itself, transportation sector itself. I just gave you one example of trucking system. If you gave, uh, I mean, if you considered a railway, uh, it's even has higher inefficiencies than this one. So the point is not that the resources are not there. Uh, the venue space is there. <clears throat> you only need a political will to explore those options. I've just picked two options. There are many other more options, but given the time limitations, I picked two. Uh, the one that just I would like to close with is uh, that in 2016 uh, report, Pakistan has a tax revenue gap of $28 billion per annum. We have been collecting tax roughly less than by an amount of $28 billion than the actual potential. So if you can save only 5% of it, uh, this can give you huge resources. And the table gives some sort of reform areas and the, uh, I have summarized some other areas that you can see. Uh, even the routine power sector and efficiencies can save you 5%, 0.5% of GDP. Uh, overall, if, if you see a very basic tax reforms, not a very deep overhauling uh, and can save you uh, roughly, if you combine all these uh, reforms, uh, it can save you around two to three percent of GDP, and if you take your GDP by three hundred thirteen billion dollars, so you can calculate. So the point that I'm just uh, I'll just conclude uh, with the point uh, that uh, Pakistan has been considerate government of Pakistan in fiscal stimulus, considerate of green recovery, but that seems a bit ad hoc. Uh, we need to reshift our focus on three key areas at least, uh, that is with the focus on green recovery, uh, that is energy sector inefficiencies must be reduced. We need to shift towards green transportation and uh, transition to green energy and fossil fuel subsidies cannot go hand in hand. And if you can only solve your truck system inefficiencies and the fossil fuel subsidies, you have enough $3.8 billion to finance in the first stage in the short run, your green energy transitions. Uh, some of these findings uh, have been based on our ongoing work at SDPI. Uh, we, we are taking an overall 
sustainable recovery from the COVID-19, uh, which is inclusive, which is green, and which is future resilient, uh, like ICT and this one. So it was a great pleasure uh, for me to be part of the team with Dr. Hina, because we shared commonly on the green energy transition. Uh, we have a very detailed analysis uh, the reports, a couple of them are published, a couple of them are upcoming. Uh, so thank you so very much. I just focused, given on the time, on the two, three major key areas. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sajid. Uh, we will now uh, go to Dr. Hina uh, to present the findings of our report, uh, COVID-19 and the future outlook of energy sector of Pakistan. Thank you so much, Dr. Sajid, first of all, um, for, for your was such a great presentation and rightly said that the major trans, uh, sources um, uh, that we are getting is from the transport and with the onset of heavy di uh, duty um, trucks, uh, the emissions um, uh, are uh, higher. And if we could look into the uh, perspective from the CPEC investments, um, the, the free that we would be expecting under CPEC uh, I think there is, um, we really need to see, um, have a data inventory to be able to identify that how much emissions we'll be able to have under those, um, those transport corridors and how we can actually make and uh, make plans right now to overcome and mitigate those issues. So there's, thank you so much for pointing this out. Um, in the interest of time, I would just skim through uh, some of these slides. Um, this is a, a study that has not been published, but some of the results. Uh, in uh, terms of the, the financing for the clean energy needs, in terms of green recovery, uh, we, um, we I would like to just give a context to uh, what we have found out. Um, I would just like my, my team to quickly skim through first of first few of the slides in terms of uh, background and the context that um, we shall be providing online. And if we could just go on directly to the to the results and some of the major findings that we have. So, um, so um, to by uh, due to COVID-19, um, the global emissions are to fall by eight and to meet, meet the Paris Agreement requires a 10 year annual decrease of 7.6% 7, 7 in terms of meeting the climate commitment. Um, and we, we have this opportunity, like we said, in a more sustainable brown, uh, to revert from sustainable unsustainable brown practices with green, uh, re uh, legated to nice to have. Uh, so it becomes very crucial that how we respond to these risks and um, uh, and how we um, these risks could be diminishes. So it's important to realign the priorities in terms of potential of new jobs that we could get in terms of uh, the stimulus having the potential to yield billions of um, uh, jobs and the green finance opportunities. Uh, that have just been highlighted by Dr. Sajid already. These are some of the impacts of COVID on different sectors, on employment, on the financial market, oil market, environment, and the others. Uh, the objective of the study was to assess the short, medium, and long-term impacts of COVID uh, on the Pakistan's energy and power sector, in including the impacts on the sectors and identifying and comparing different economic stimulus packages provided by the economies with that of Pakistan and identify the opportunity to foster clean and green um, uh, energy system for, for, for Pakistan uh, clean energy um, transition. So there have been some policy actions um, and some economic recovery stimulus packages being announced by, uh, the, by the government of Pakistan already. Now, in terms of um, the framework of the study, we have idea, we have um, used this long-range alternative planning model for Pakistan uh, in within a 5-15 year horizon. Uh, this modeling is used to forecast the energy supply, demand, and emissions, and assessing the long-term impacts and the stimulus policies against dimensions of environment, energy, and socioeconomics. These are some of the scenarios that we had um, developed for um, uh, slow recovery, business as usual, and in terms of green recovery. The working shell. Yes, I think, uh, so the post-COVID outlook, we have um, projections for GDP growth in terms of pre-COVID was 700 billion. 
for fast recovery options, GDP growth to a maximum of 600 billion by 2040, and the projections in terms of slow economic recovery for three years that we have identified the GDP growth to a maximum of 525 billion by 2040. In terms of energy demand, green recovery scenario, uh, demand um, uh, dropped after 2025 due to efficient technologies. So by adopting these energy efficient technologies um, and reducing the, um, the uh, transmission and distribution losses, Pakistan can annually save around 330 gigajoules of the energy. In terms of, um, this is a global um, comparison with the, some other, with the uh, countries like other developing parts of the world. Uh, a green recovery will ensure emission reduction of around 10 million tons annually. Um, this is the share of different energy resources in all scenarios. Um, we, we see that the renewable energy share in the green recovery scenario seems to have um, hydro, solar and wind by 2040. In the power sector for achieving targets for a green recovery, the countries would require around 120 billion in the same year. In 2030 for a green recovery, Pakistan will require an additional 12 billion or around 2.4% of the GDP. So just the concluding remarks. Um, the, so the full effect of pandemic on the renewable energy sector is not clear. Of course, it's ongoing with the um, so second and the third wave. But moving forward, supply chain disruptions and ongoing reduced demand will undoubtedly impact the energy transition in the longer term. Finances must averse to the risks for future disruptions. And lower energy prices may raise the cost of finance and deliver further challenges. Thus, this financial or economic stimulus can play a key role in the economic recovery of Pakistan and the, um, the role of um, overcoming the crisis in the energy and the power sector, um, making it uh, once again more pronounced. So some of the recommendations is to invest in clean energy infrastructure, energy efficiency, education and training, um, in terms of uh, immediate unemployment, natural capital investments for ecosystem resilience and regeneration, clean cooking access, clean regeneration. And uh, fossil fuel subsidies to be reduced, investment and production tax credits, subsidies for EVs, carbon neutrality targets, decarbonization policies, green development and natural capital funds. Um, exploring the possible use of hydrogen as in happening in developing parts of the world, along with all these growth of renewables, improvements in um, uh, reductions in carbon intensive solutions and uh, looking into um, uh, the uh, targets of achieving SDG 7, uh, targets of the Paris Agreement. Uh, we need to ensure that all these, um, uh, the, the government stimulus uh, has to leverage um, the private sector finance uh, through regulations and incentives and uh, come up with some, um, some viable solutions for the long-term um, uh, strategy for economic growth uh, of Pakistan. This is all from me um, right now. Thank you so much.